Uh, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for attending. My name is Erin and I am an Environmental Project Officer with Mid Coast Council. And we're here this evening as part of our Catchment and Marine Discovery Series. So this is a series that we run, run quite regularly. We invite a lot of our local scientists um, to come and talk about the great work that they're doing both in our region and in other areas that's then applied to this region. So we have a great talk to, for you tonight. Um, I'd like to thank Hunter Local Land Services for their partnership in this project and also the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment who are doing great work with the Manning River Turtle. So we're going to talk about a few different things tonight. We have representatives not only from uh, DPIE but also the Manning Conservation Group, uh, sorry, Manning Turtle Conservation Group and also Mid Coast Council and I'd like to welcome them all this evening. So first of all, our first speaker is going to be Andrew Steed. Andrew is a Threatened Species Officer with the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Andrew is also widely known as Steedy and works on our Saving Our Species program as a species coordinator for the endangered Manning River turtle. Steedy grew up with a pet freshwater turtle, Mortis the tortoise, in Sydney where he enjoyed feeding its snails and came to love their quiet charm. Steedy has been working with threatened species for 25 years and has never lost his passion for the natural world of which the Manning River Turtle is a particular favourite. So I'll pass it over to Andrew for his presentation this evening. Yeah, thanks Erin. I'll um, just start my presentation now and we see how we'll go. Right, uh, thanks Erin for the opportunity to present some information on the Manning River Turtle Conservation Program. I will start with some general background information on the Manning River Turtle and then move on to the results of the surveys that we've done so far. I'll then take a short break and the Manning River Turtle Conservation Group will tell their story before I would like to resume and provide a perspective of some of the issues and threats facing the Manning River Turtle. Okay, there are around 40 species of freshwater turtle according to the most recent book on uh, freshwater turtles of Australia. That's the uh, image in the top right. And there are two distinct groups based on the length of the neck, either long-necked or short-necked. Eight freshwater turtles occur in New South Wales, including one feral, the red-eared slider turtle, which is mainly confined to Sydney. And we think it's got uh, into waterways because people have um, released pets that they didn't want. The other seven freshwater turtles are two long-necked turtles and five short-necked turtles. Four of these are in the genus Myachilles, and three of these are endangered, all occurring in northern New South Wales. One on, the, uh, one on the New England Tableland and the other two in the Bellinger and Manning Valleys. The name My Achilles comes from a combination of an Aboriginal word, Myuna, meaning clear water, and a Greek word, Chiles, meaning turtle. The Manning River turtle is named after a noted herpetologist from North Sydney, Mr M Malcolm Purvis. There are three different types of freshwater turtles in the Manning Valley. One is the common long neck turtle, uh, which is the one that you often see crossing roads and in farm dams. They wander widely across the landscape, sometimes without rhyme or reason. Their long necks can be fully retracted into the shell, making it hard for predators to kill them. The other two are both short neck turtles that do not leave rivers other than to nest. They can't fully retract their heads, making them vulnerable to predation. One is the native but introduced Murray River turtle that inhabits inland rivers. It has a pale cream stripe on its head and a very pale underside, which is also known as the plastron. The other one is the Manning River turtle, the one I'm going to talk about today, with bold gold markings, which is more prominent on young males and with a very darkly orange gold mottled pattern on their underside. The Manning River turtle is often regarded as one of the most beautiful freshwater Australian turtles, making it highly sought after by turtle collectors and subject to illegal collection, especially from readily accessible locations in the Manning Valley. It tends to rest in deeper pools with rocky or stony bottoms, and we think it likes the colder water of the upper catchment. Uh, it's thought to come out to feed on fruits, bugs and vegetation in shallow areas at night and around dusk and dawn. It's rarely seen as it often hides in the day, having the amazing ability to be, 
breathe through its bum. This also allows it to stay underwater for very long periods in winter when cold water slows its metabolism down. They've recently been seen mating underwater in autumn and it is believed that they nest after the first good rains in late spring, early summer. They nest on sandy gravel beds close to water and uh, you, we think it's after good rains like happens in the other Myakili species. It is thought they may live between 30 to 40 years, but this is yet to be confirmed and it will take quite a long study to work out exactly how long they can live. The Manning River turtle was listed endangered in New South Wales in April 2017 and has been nominated as endangered nationally. It was listed as endangered because turtle experts have noticed an apparent decline in abundance and its distribution is severely fragmented. There was a very poor understanding of where it lives with few surveys in the remote upper catchments, particularly in the northwest up there and in the west along the Barnard River. These areas have very few tracks, are very rugged and have long sections of inaccessible rivers other than through walking. Threats include habitat degradation, illegal collection, predation and disease like the one that devastated its sister species, the Bellinger River turtle. It is also vulnerable to competition and interbreeding with the introduced Murray River turtle, which is known to have adversely affected the Bellinger River turtle by creating hybrids. Following its listing as endangered, it was placed in the data deficient stream of the Saving Our Species program. This allowed us to attract funding for baseline surveys to determine where it lives in the Manning Valley. We organised three ecologists to survey different parts of the Manning Valley using different techniques depending on river conditions. Where water clarity is poor, nets were used. There are two types of nests. Cathedral nests, shown at the top, are used in deeper pools and are long cylinders that stand up with floats to ensure animals caught can breathe. Turtles come in through the bottom of the net where there are, are gaps in the netting and they go up through the various chambers to try and get the bait in the very top chamber. Fike nets shown on the top right are long tunnels with the tops out of the water and are used in shallow water. They have two wings at the front to funnel animals into the net. Where water clarity is good, snorkelers will enter the water and catch turtles by hand. Each turtle is caught, each, after each turtle is caught, it is measured, weighed, inspected to determine its sex and so any signs of disease and deformities. The shells are also permanently marked without hurting them as shown in that photo on the bottom right. This gives us information about movement and growth rates and eventually the size of the population. They are then released back into the river where they were captured. As well as turtles, the nets capture a wide variety of other animals, including platypus, eels, fish, crayfish, and even a goanna, which would have been a challenge to get out of the net. The information collected on these species is stored in the New South Wales Bionet, a publicly accessible database of plant and animal sightings. They've also caught bull routes, also known as freshwater stonefish, and they have a series of poisonous spines around the body that cause excruciating pain if you get jabbed. And I've been with someone who's been jabbed and I've never seen anyone in so much pain. One net on the mid Manning caught eight of these bull routes, requiring a very delicate operation to extract them without getting stung. We have been lucky to work with such an enthusiastic and supportive community as the people of the Manning Valley. Over 115 landowners have allowed us to access rivers and creeks to do turtle surveys. These range from large pastoral stations such as Glenrock Station out here in the western part of the catchment um, and the Coopla Currapa Station up in the northwest through to small farms, travelling stock reserves and small council reserves. We can also do surveys where rivers are in state forests and national parks. This has given us access to about 500 kilometres of riverfront which is what we estimate about 35% of potential Manning River turtle habitat. Not all parts of the rivers are suitable for surveys. Some parts are too shallow, other parts 
too fast flowing. Sometimes high turbidity means that we can't go snorkeling. And sometimes there's just an inability to get down to the water because of cliffs or thick, impenetrable vegetation. But honestly, it's been a real honour to work and celebrate the Manning community and tell them all about the Manning River Turtle. This is a time series of the known locations of Manning River turtles, which also shows the number of turtles caught at each site. Basically, the warmer the colour, the higher the number of turtles that we've caught at a location. Uh, the first surveys were back in 1973 with three sites. They're the purple crosses, and then one in 1979 and two more in 1986. It was then nearly 30 years before any more surveys were done. In 2013, the number of known sites was increased to nine locations. In 2015, it increased to 11 locations. And in 2017, there were just 13 known locations. The Manning River turtle was then listed as endangered and we started to get some funds from the Saving Our Species program. In 2018, there were 31 known locations and in 2019, it jumped to 70, with another four added this year after surveys of fire-affected locations around Bobin in this area to the north of Wingham. Most of the sites where Manning River turtles have been caught are in the upper catchments, with the western flowing Barnard River along this stretch out this way uh, being a stronghold. Manning River turtles were detected in the south of the Manning Valley, down near Gloucester in this part of the catchment, um, in, for the first time in 2019, and more effort will be made to survey other sites in this part of the valley. From all the surveys caught, uh, done so far, nearly 400 Manning turtles have been caught, and most of them have been marked. So far, only 11 marked turtles have been recaught, with only one not caught at the place where it was originally marked. This turtle had moved about three and a half kilometres upstream. Surveys have been done at over 140 sites, with Manning River turtles recorded at 84, or about 60% of sites. In total, over 6,000 hours of trapping and over 42 kilometres of snorkelling have been done since 2018. The photo at the top shows what I regard as being prime Manning River turtle habitat, with a deep hole on the far bank, logs to hide under, and a stony shallow area for feeding. This shallow area probably grades to a sandy gravel beach that are the sort of areas where they like to nest. The bottom photo, photo shows what I think is the cutest Manning River turtle caught yet. This graph shows the number of Manning River turtles caught by their size and sex and tells us a bit about the structure of the population. The yellow represents females, the green the males, and the blue young turtles whose sex couldn't be determined. You tell the sex of Manning River turtles by the length of their tail, with males having much longer tails. Tail length starts to change when the turtles are about 10 to 12 centimetres long, and we think that's somewhere between 5 and 10 years old. Females grow larger than males, with the largest female we caught at 23 centimetres, and the largest males at about 18 centimetres. The smallest turtle we caught was just 7 centimetres. Corresponding in this in weight, the heaviest turtle we caught was 1.64 kilos, and the lightest was only 40 grams. Females represent about 60% of turtles. Possibly this is because they're hungrier and they go into the nets for the bait. But it does indicate that the, uh, there is a good, healthy breeding cohort of females in the population. And encouragingly, there is a good range of sizes. This means that there is um, predation is probably not decimating the populations like other turtles. And the breeding is successful in many parts of the Manning Valley. Uh, okay, this is the end of the first session, and I'd like to hand over to the wonderful Manning River Turtle Conservation Group, who've done so much in the local community to raise awareness about the Manning River Turtle and its precarious existence. Without their links to many members of the Manning Valley community, we wouldn't have been able to do surveys at so many different locations in the last three years. And these are photos of some of the locations that we've done surveys at, and that 
freshwater turtle ecologists who've been doing this, the surveys have said in some locations they've never seen better aquatic habitat um, anywhere in New South Wales. So it's quite a privilege to have such wonderful uh, habitat in the Manning Valley. And I will now pass over to the Manning River Turtle Conservation Group. Uh, thanks, Andrew. So um, just before the turtle group, um, we're going to have a great presentation from them as well. Um, but we might just do some questions for Andrew, just on that first section of the um, presentation. So you can just use that Q&A function that's down the bottom there, as I mentioned, um, and that will allow us to, to read those questions. Um, just while we're waiting for people to ask some questions, though, Andrew, I guess I have a question. Um, straight off the bat, you mentioned that um, you did some extra survey work um, in areas that were burnt in last year's bushfires. Um, you did manage to find some turtles there. How do you feel that the drought and the bushfires affected the turtle population? Was there any evidence of that? Um, not directly, actually, um, because we actually re-trapped the turtle that we caught last year. So it managed to get through a year of the last year of that drought when uh, the creek it was in, Bobin Creek, just became a series of disconnected pools. Um, and that part of Bobin Creek was really heavily impacted by the fires. So um, I think it's a case of where the turtles were lucky enough to be in a pool that re remained permanent the whole time, they probably just lost some body condition and hunkered down and just waited it out. And you've got to remember these turtles have been around for 50 million years. In that 50 million years, we've gone through a number of... Um, ice ages and during ice ages the, the all the water is basically locked up in ice caps and the climate becomes much more arid so I think that um, the Manning River turtle probably has a lot of experience in dealing with um, climatic extremes but what I think it's is its challenges is rapidly changing climate change like we're undergoing at the moment um, and also the um, the impacts of human settlement uh, that we've brought to the Manning Valley in the last 250 years. Um, awesome. Just on uh, sort of a bit of an extension to that, Alex has just asked, how do turtles survive drought conditions and how much water do they need? Uh, they need water to basically, uh, they need it for hydration. Um, they're not able to survive for long periods out of water because they can't perspire. Um, so they basically cook in their own, um, their own juices if they're not able to cool themselves down. It's not a very pleasant death. Um, and we really don't understand a lot of the physiology of turtles. Um, Manning River turtles in particular are very difficult to study because we know so little about them. We're just getting into the stage where we are really looking to set up a more detailed research program hopefully with the University of Newcastle to engage a PhD student to do a much longer term study of um, ecology, uh, doing radio tracking, um, diet studies, and looking at their mating behavior, their nesting behavior. So there's a lot more that we can do and there are still, still a lot more questions to be answered. Awesome. Um, so a bit of an extension of that one to that answer there. Uh, Jamaica has asked, how long does the Manning River turtle live for and does it have gills? No, it doesn't have gills. Um, it has a very similar structure to gill in its cloaca, which is its rear vent that um, it poos through and um, urinates and also lays eggs. <coughs> um, so it's a very similar structure. It's not technically a gill. <coughs> um, we don't know how long they live. Um, that's part of the marking. So we can see how much a turtle grows in a year. Um, in good seasons, when there's plenty of food, it will grow relatively quickly in those drought years when it, there's a short supply of food it probably slows down its metabolism and doesn't put on much weight the general thinking is 30 to 40 years um, different species probably live different times uh, i just saw a video today of its sister turtle up on the tablelands and this female was 30 centimeters big and the ecologist who caught her estimated she could be 60 or more years old. So it's, um, it's up for debate, basically. But once we start doing these sort of studies, we'll start to get a better idea. But at least a minimum, I would say, of 20 to 30 years. 
Okay, awesome. Um, Andrew's asked, was there any correlation between the numbers of turtles found and their relative proximity to the river riffle zone, considering their cloaca respiration and oxygen levels in the water? I haven't even thought about that. Um, because we've... Uh, uh, I'd have to go back and actually look at the exact location of every turtle caught and look at the river conditions in proximity to it. Um, I would say that, yes, there would be a correlation because they're the areas where they're going to come out and feed on the, the invertebrate la larva that typically inhabit the bottom of um, rocks and stones in those shallower areas where you get more sunlight. So you get more, um, photosynthesis of aquatic plants, increased dissolves oxygen. So I think that there's probably a correlation between those areas where there's deep pool near a riffle zone. Um, but having said that, it's, the riffle zones are difficult to search because there's so much water movement. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so there are some other questions here, but some of it is on topics that we will cover later on. So um, I'll come back to those questions when we get to our other topics. Um, so for now, what we will do is we will hand over to the Manning Turtle Conservation Group. And the Conservation Group is a small group of committed and passionate individuals from the Manning Valley who are dedicated to helping protect the endangered Manning River helmeted turtle. This group does a great job and we're really happy to have them come and present to us tonight. And tonight we have three members from the group, Kerry Guppy, Bronwyn Ellis and Claire Rourke joining us. So I'm going to pass it over to Kerry. Take it away. Thanks, Erin. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And thank you so much for Mid Coast Council for inviting us to speak today. Uh, we'd also like to have uh, pass on our thanks to Stevie as well from DPIE, who's been an, um, an enormous support to our group as well. Uh, so what we thought we would talk about tonight is um, about our group and how we formed, uh, the work that we have been doing, and then um, what we see coming for the future as well. So um, the Manning River Turtle Conservation Group formed in early 2017 as a group of like-minded individuals who had taken an interest in the Manning River Turtle. And we all heard about the turtle in different ways. Some of us heard uh, Peter Scouten talking on the ABC. Um, he did a podcast series. Um, and others had heard from other, from other um, avenues. Uh, but we decided that we wanted to do something about the Manning River Turtle. And our first aim was to uh, get the, aware, the community aware that the turtle even existed um, and that it was threatened. Though um, when we first uh, did start up, it hadn't officially been listed as endangered, um, which didn't happen until April 2017. So as part of the Wingham Activation Plan, we ran the very first winter solstice walk in um, June 2017. And you can see on the slideshow there, we had a huge response from the community. There was about 200 people who came along. And this was a free event for families. We also did a colouring competition with uh, the local um, schools in Wingham and preschools. And this promoted heaps of discussion um, about the turtle in classrooms. So from the success of this, we actually then officially formed as a group under the auspice of the Manning Valley Neighbourhood Service. And we worked very closely with the Wingham Chamber of Commerce as well mm -hmm. to run our lantern walk on an annual basis. We also set up a Facebook page and began to be an advocacy group for the turtle. With the survey showing that um, there were depleting numbers and stories like the Bellingen River turtle population that had suffered from a virus, the idea was established for a captive insurance population through Aussie Ark, um, which is based at the Australian Reptile Park. You can see there on the screen the really cute little hatchling, and I'll just explain how, that, how we got to that point. So the idea is that um, the turtles could be bred at this facility and then released into the wild when they're uh, old enough to defend for themselves. And, um, and it was particularly important if there were effects such as severe conditions, um, we did have the drought and the bushfires or a virus like they'd had in the Bellingen River. Um, that we would still have a breeding population. So the Manning River Turtle Conservation Group assisted Tim Faulkner and Diane, Dan Rumsey uh, by contacting business in, businesses in the local area to partner with Aussie Ark 
or donate to the fundraising. And we had a huge response from the businesses and the community, um, which um, was meant that we were successful in raising $110,000 to build the enclosure. Um, and that's now up and running and really exciting that there's actually 20 hatchlings in there with seven un adult turtles under their care. So I'm going to hand over now to Bronwyn, who's going to run through a few more of the activities that we've been up to. Thanks, Kerry, for that. A significant event was organised by the Department of Primary Indi uh, Planning, Industry and Environment in June last year, where Wingham hosted a two-day workshop to convene turtle experts, researchers, landholders and ecologists and come up with a plan to ensure the turtle's survival. From this, a steering committee was formed, which includes representatives from uh, Mid, -North, Mid Coast Council, the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, local land services and land care tied with their Indigenous rangers and, of course, our group. The aim of the committee is to try and keep progressing with plans we made at the workshop, as well as share information, apply for grants and assist researchers and surveys and keep the community engaged. From creating awareness of the turtle, we moved into education. We have held stalls at markets like Envirofair Taree, Old Bar, Mundrook and Killabark as well as speaking at schools, preschools and scouts. Tim Faulkner has spoken at schools in Manningnet and we continue to support the work of Aussie Ark are doing for collecting turtles for their breeding population. We have also engaged with local media in, in print, radio and TV to give updates on the turtle. Then this year, um, a Manning River turtle was actually seen laying eggs by a very informed and engaged landholder. And she was able to assist um, Aussie Ark to retrieve the eggs. She secured uh, the nest with some wire so it couldn't be predated by foxes. And um, then Aussie Ark were able to come in and remove the eggs successfully before uh, predicted flooding occurred. So we'd like to thank that landowner and, and acknowledge the great work she did um, in being so observant and um, rescuing, helping to rescue those eggs. These were incubated at the reptile park and were released and will be released when suitable. And now over to Claire. So from here, we're thinking... We've got more work to do. So we would like to keep liaising with other groups who are doing awesome work for turtles in other areas like the Bells Turtle and the Bellinger River Turtle so we can learn from their successes. Um, we'd like to increase citizen science opportunities, especially for landholders, because they have access to the river frontage where there are turtles and they can assist with um, monitoring the water quality, the riparian vegetation and the health of the rivers, and also protect with the um, breeding sites if, if they see where they are. We'd like to assist these landholders with more knowledge and hopefully more funding to protect their stretch of frontage and the turtles' habitat. We'd like to assist where we can with um, fox control, and but we are very mindful of the role of the dingo in relation to um, fox numbers. We would like to continue to be advocates for the turtle and be a local support for government agencies, university researchers, not-for-profits like Aussie Ark. We really want to keep the community engaged with science and the arts. And we are really lucky to have artists such as um, Gemma Cross, who you can see up on the screen, made that beautiful felt turtle. Um, Peter Scouten, who's a natural history illustrator. Um, and Jill Watkins, who made um, Manning River Turtles on stilts. So we really want to keep um, going with events and education and fundraising. And this is where we're calling on um, more community members to help. What we're also really mindful of is the fact that by protecting the turtle habitat in our area, we can assist other threatened species in our area, like um, the platypus and the spiny crayfish, 
but we can also protect the riparian flora for biodiversity and for corridors um, and for refuge pools. So we, we really like the idea that protecting the turtle will have a flow on effect for um, other um, special animals in our area. So to find out more about what you can do, you can go to these places. Um, our website is on the screen, www.manningriverturtle.org. We've got a Facebook page with this new logo, which I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, but you'll be there. Um, you can email us at any time on hello at manningriverturtle.org. Um, and we can, even if it's a question that's not for us, we can forward it on for you to researchers or um, other agencies who we think can help you. If you see a turtle or you think you've got a turtle or if you have um, river frontage where you think there are turtles and you'd like to provide um, access for surveyors, please email Andrew on the um, email on your screen, andrew.steed at environment.nsw.gov.au. Um, keep your eye out for turtles. Use TurtleSat, which is an app for reporting turtle sightings, and look for updates on the cute little hatchlings on the Aussie Ark website, um, which is also on the screen. We um, have another event which is coming up in September for Threatened Species Month. Um, it's going to be promoted soon and it's part of the Threatened Species Trail through DPIE and we thank DPIE for assisting us with this. Um, so stay tuned on our webpage and Facebook site for more information about this because it's going to be limited numbers only. Um, we welcome your assistance with ideas and help with events always. So please feel free to contact us on the email on the screen. Thank you so much, Claire, Kerry, Bronwyn. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we know you guys are doing fantastic work and we definitely want people to get involved. Um, from this point, though, we're going to start taking some Q&A questions. So if you've got a question, just use that Q&A function down the bottom and we'll jump straight into some questions. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Erin. So are there any plans to expand the captive management project further and involve other zoological institutes in the program? Yeah, that's, I guess that's up to Tim Faulkner and Aussie Ark for that. At the moment, I think it's mostly um, uh, they're aiming for 12 adult turtles and they've already got the 20 hatchlings. I think that might be their um, capacity at the moment. They are expanding into other turtles, other um, freshwater turtles like the hunter turtle. I think they're trying to um, expand their assistance. But I think, yeah, that's, that question is best directed at um, Aussie Ark, I think. Yeah, no, fair enough. And, and Andrew, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not a problem at all. Andrew, did you want to chime in at all? Did you have an answer for that one? or you? Uh, at this stage, no, we don't have any other plans. Um, the other two organisations that do captive breeding for turtles are Taronga Park and the Symbio Wildlife Park at um, Helensburg. And they both pretty much have their hands full with the Bellinger River turtle. <clears throat> so... We've, um, we've sort of really tried to really just focus in on Aussie Ark um, because they have a lot of experience with uh, turtles and down the track there may be opportunities, but at this stage capacity is pretty much full across New South Wales. Um, there's also some issues around uh, hygiene management. Um, so we've got to be fairly careful about how many people are breeding many river turtles, where they come from, where they go back to. So there's a whole lot of management issues we need to be aware of and um, just be, be cognizant of um, there are risks associated with captive breeding and not just launch into it um, willy nilly. Excellent, thank you. Um, did anybody else have any other questions? Just uh, type it into the Q&A down the bottom there. Um, okay, we have another question. Are the 10 hatchlings <coughs> from the wild going to be returned? Uh, yes, they will go back to um, the nest site of the turtle that was found. Um, so that is actually quite an important um, consideration when we're releasing hatchling turtles. Excellent, thank you. That looks like that's all the questions for that section. So um, if we don't have anything more to add, we'll move back across to Andrew and he can finish his presentation. Right, I would now like to talk about some of the threats and issues that have risen from the recent drought, fires and floods and share a few other little insights that we've come across in the last couple of years. Okay, Manning River turtles are very vulnerable to predation. 
because they cannot fully retract their head into their shell. So if they can basically have their heads bitten off by predators such as foxes, cats, pigs, and possibly even goannas and quolls. They are especially vulnerable when the females are laying eggs and the predators can smell them and get two courses at the same time, both the eggs and the turtle. The sister species, Bell's turtle, which occurs on the New England tableland, has suffered greatly from predation. There, is, there are very few young turtles in the populations and fox predation of nests is estimated to be greater than 95%. Unless this is decreased, it is inevitable the species will eventually go extinct once all the adults die of old age or fox predation. Foxes are also eating tur nesting turtles, with the top photo showing six dead female bell turtles around a fox den on the New England tablelands. This um, video shows a fox raiding three nests in one night. So you can see the fox here, moves from one nest, gorgeous on the eggs, goes, finds another nest, does the same thing. And finally, it moves on to the third nest. A similar story also exists for the endemic population of the Murray River turtle in the Murray-Darling Basin, where nest predation is greater than 93%. The lower amount of clearing in the Mountain Valley compared to inland New South Wales may be one reason for less fox predation because they don't tend to go into densely vegetated areas but prefer the open uh, pastoral or agricultural country. Uh, another serious threat is from the Murray River turtle. It is introduced in the Manning Valley, most likely being dumped as unwanted pets and put in the river to be kind to the turtle, but not very kind to the Manning River turtle. Um, they're typically sold in pet shops, but they are only endemic to the inland rivers of the Murray-Darling Basin. Murray River turtles are much larger than the Manning River turtle. The largest we've caught was over 28 centimetres, compared to 23 for the largest Manning River turtle. This means they can outcompete the Manning River turtle for food, habitat and nesting sites. They can also interbreed with Manning River turtles, diluting their genes and causing turtles with mixed features of both. This is known to have happened to the sister species, the Bellinger River turtle. The number of locations and Murray, of Murray River turtles has increased over the year, with 15 caught in one location in 2015, uh, 13, that yellow dot at, um, that's Cundall Flat, um, and another four turtles caught in 2015. Then when we started doing our surveys in 2018, we picked them up at six locations, um, with 10 turtles at Cundall Flat, here, Rocky Crossing down on the Barrington River, number one up on the Nowandock, Kimbrickai, or Kimbricky, and Carrick Flat, which are very close together here in the mid Manning River. Then last year in 2019, we caught 54 Murray River turtles, including turtles at DeWitt on the Little Manning River and Tibbock on the Little Manning River and McCaffrey's Flat and a staggering 34 Murray River turtles at the Cundall Flat site. So they are both increasing in numbers and moving up the rivers and have the capacity to move as, as much as 20 kilometres in a day from studies done elsewhere in their uh, distribution. So the fires of 2019-20 that roared through the north of the Manning Valley destroyed homes, the Bowburn School and infrastructure like power, phone, fences, machinery and sheds. It also roasted fire-sensitive vegetation along rivers that shade rivers and creeks and contain fruiting trees like figs and lily pillies that provide important food for Manning River turtles. One quarter of the riparian vegetation in the Manning River turtle habitat was burnt, with much of it being killed due to its fire sensitivity. It also caused huge amounts of leaf fall into pool that rots down and decreases water quality. It also caused trees to fall into creeks. And while this can provide turtle shelter for turtles, it makes it difficult for us to do snorkeling surveys um, as it uh, is impossible to get around them. The loss of ground cover vegetation 
and soil structure in the upper layers of the soil layer from the intense heat of the fire mobilises the soil and ash the next time it rained. After rain, it is then deposited as silt and ash in the pools where the turtles rest and also causes changes to water acidity. This is some photos of the surveys that we did this year in the creeks north of Wingham. Uh, they were taken in March 2020, about four to five months after the fires. You can see that some riparian vegetation is not resprouted, meaning less shade, so water temperatures increase. This is not good for Manning River turtles, as it appears they prefer the cooler water of the upper catchment and rivers. It also means less food, as the fruit of lily peas and figs is important for turtles. In response to the fire, fires, the Hunter Local Land Services organised for an ecologist to do surveys in the fire affected creeks north of Wingham. He surveyed 17 sites and caught 19 Manning River turtles, including new locations at Kip Axes, up here in the head of Dingo Creek, and at Capra to the west of uh, Bowburn. Encouragingly, he recaught a previously caught Manning River turtle at the same location he caught it in 2019, here at Bowburn Creek. So it survived both the fires and the extended drought, which I'll talk about next. Every resident in the Manning Valley was impacted by the extended drought that started in 2014 and gradually worsened until 2020, when all the rivers stopped flowing and they had, tra had to truck water in for the people of Gloucester. No one trucked in water for the turtles, however. The Barnard River, one of the strongholds for the Manning River turtle, first stopped flowing around March 2019. And while there were occasional flash floods, persistent flows never recovered until the rains of January, February 2020. The graph on the left shows the percent of average animal discharge of, for the main rivers of the Manning Valley. Uh, the average annual is that red dotted line. It shows the most recent drought where the rivers stopped flowing entirely, that circle on, on the screen. Um, it also show, it shows how they steadily dropped without any respite, unlike the previous uh, drought from 2002 to 2017, when there was a respite in the middle. It also shows a trend with the droughts getting longer compared to previous ones in the last century. So we're getting an increased severity and an increased length of droughts in the Manning Valley. And the photo on the uh, there shows the Barnard River completely dry when surveys were done in March last year. The drought severely impacted the Barnard River and the fires that were ranging all around the landscape meant that we were not allowed into the upper Barnard because of the risk of getting trapped in there and fires um, coming out. So it wasn't until January 2020 that we got permission from National Parks to go in and they organised for Saving Our Species staff and the crew from Aussie Ark to go into Karakabundi National Park to do food drops for brush-tailed rock wallabies and to inspect Manning River turtle habitat. After a two and a half hour rough four wheel drive in, what we found was not good. We found dead and emaciated brush tailed rock wallabies, dead and dying vegetation along the river and on hillsides, long stretches of very dry riverbeds separated by shallow mud wallows, and dead turtles where pools had become completely dry. Luckily, the ranger told us about a deep permanent pool nearby, and it was still holding a good amount of, of water. So we decided that it was time to intervene and the Aussie Ark crew jumped into the mud wallows and expertly wrangled 22 Manning River turtles for relocation to permanent pools. And you can see Tim Faulkner passing a turtle to uh, a field officer in the photos there. They also collected three turtles for their insurance population with the female that they collected laying 22 eggs in February this year and 11 successful hatchlings emerged in March this year. It is planned to release young turtles in November this year at the place where their mother was caught on the Barnard River. In the rain of the late afternoon of February, uh, sorry, Friday the 17th of January this year, a smitten freshwater turtle lover who lives at Carrick Flat on the Mid Manning found a female Manning River turtle laying eggs into a nest dug into the riverbank. 
This is the first ever discovery of a Manning River turtle nest, and it was about 20 centimetres deep and very close to the river in a sandy gravel beach area. She waited for it to stop finish laying and then protected the nest with some netting to stop foxes digging up the eggs and eating them. Because the nest was vulnerable to predation, in danger of being trampled by cattle who walked to the river to drink, and the potential for the nest to flood once water levels returned to normal, it was decided to move the eggs to the Australian Reptile Park where they would be incubated and hatched. And on March, um, March the 5th, all 10 eggs successfully hatched and they'll be grown until they are able to fend for themselves in the wild. And they will also be released to the place where the eggs were collected. This is a grainy video in, because of the rain and low light uh, of the nesting turtle at Carrick Flat. And thanks goes to Alex Granger for providing the video. So that was a spectacular find and we're hoping to find more Manning River Turtles Nest in the coming uh, years. Following that rain, we then, um, and following the devastating drought and ferocious fires, the next natural disaster to the Manning Valley was floods. In relatively quick succession, there was a big flood, rapidly followed by a couple of smaller floods. While replenishment of the Parch rivers was welcome, the flood sent down a wall of dirty water laden with years of collected fallen debris. Uh, it's sweeping away all in its path. Rivers rose five to 10 metres rapidly, heavily laden with soil and ash from fire grounds, where all the understory and ground cover vegetation had been completely incinerated. This was deposited on riverbeds and banks as the waters receded, leaving sticky muddy banks and silty riverbeds that turned to opaque cloudy water when disturbed. Surveys in March 2020 in the relatively undisturbed Rollies River, where 16 Manning River turtles were caught in March last year, found none. The bottom of the river was thick with fine silt that clouded the water when snorkeling through looking for turtles. At the same time, along the Barnard River, surveys only found Manning River turtles resting in a small area of cobblestones on the bottom of the river and none where there were silt deposits. As mentioned, Aussie Ark have established an insurance population for the Manning River turtle. Following the collection of the three turtles from a drought ravaged Barnard River in January this year, in mid-March, further surveys were undertaken to collect more turtles from several different locations. One male was collected from each of four different locations. The Barnard River at Corroboree Flat, where we have caught a good number of turtles over the years. A farm at Bretty, below the junction of the Manning and Little, the Little Manning and Barnard River. A farm at Cobark on the Barrington River. And from a private conservation area on uh, Kip axes at on Dingo Creek. A total of 12 adult Manning River turtles will be collected with a, sur a survey planned in November this year to collect five adult females, some of whom we are hoping may also be airing, bearing eggs like the one from Currakabundi National Park. The captive breeding program is being overseen by Dr. Ricky Spencer uh, from the University of Western Sydney, a well-known turtle ecologist. So where to from here? Together with Saving Our Species Program and the Mid Coast Council, the Hunter Local Land Service has applied for an application for funding under the Federal Wildlife and Habitat Bushfire Recovery Program. The application is for just shy of a quarter of a million dollars and has three main objectives to help recover Manning River turtle habitat after the fires. Firstly, there will be riparian vegetation restoration and rehabilitation, including weeding and planting. There'll be fencing off of riparian vegetation to protect Manning River turtle habitat and improve water quality. And thirdly, by undertaking additional feral predator control in the upper catchments where foxes and pigs are more prevalent. We also are planning ongoing surveys and monitoring to determine population size and structure revisiting some sites that we've been to before as part of a monitoring program, as well as new sites not previously surveyed before. We're always looking for new places to survey, so tell your friends, relatives, neighbours, and anyone else you know with river frontage, and ask them to get in contact with either me 
or the Manning River Turtle Conservation Group. And thank you for your interest in the Manning River Turtle. Uh, I can be contacted by email or phone as shown in the bottom of this slide. And I will now answer uh, questions that you may have. Thanks and keep, uh, keep up your enthusiasm for the Manning River Turtle. Excellent, thank you so much, Andrew. That was a great presentation. We really appreciate you being with us here this evening. And uh, we hope to look forward to learning more and hearing more about the Manning River Turtle going forward. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions, uh, they are more than welcome to, to ring me. I love talking about the Manning River Turtle and we'll talk uh, in my sleep about it. Thanks very much. Thank you. So one of the things that we really recognise at Midcoast Council is just how important our waterways are and uh, how important it is that we manage those waterways. So we actually got a question asked just previously um, about what we're doing, what, what tools we're using and what management techniques we're using to protect our waterways. And a really big part of that is the new catchment management plan that we're writing for the many. So I'm actually going to invite Louise Duff, who is our catchment coordinator, to talk a little bit about that project and how it's working and how you can get involved with the catchment management plan. So over to you, Louise. Hi everyone, um, thanks Erin. So I'm Louise Duff, the catchment coordinator with Midcoast Council. I'm in the natural systems team and I'm leading development of a catchment management plan for the Manning River, um, particularly with a focus on the estuary as well and it is a whole of catchment, a whole of catchment approach to um, managing the system. Um, in terms of timeline, that plan will be coming out next year. So at the moment, we're in a phase where we're doing issue analysis and we're looking at a range of issues, including fauna conservation, um, which obviously this uh, topic is really highly relevant to. We're also looking at riparian vegetation and um, maintaining and improving uh, the riparian vegetation. Um, there's quite a lot of issues all in all for the whole catchment, things like acid sulfate soil, uh, water flow rates and quantity, and also quality. So we're looking at diffuse source agriculture as part of that. Um, so yeah, I would welcome anyone who would like to uh, be consulted as part of development of that plan. Perhaps you could just put your name and email address in the chat and I'll take a note of that and be in touch. We will also be consulting, of course, with all the environmental groups and stakeholder agencies. So um, the Turtle Conservation Group, of course, um, Platypus Network and so on. Uh, and that phase of consultation is sort of coming up between now and the end of this year. So yeah, fantastic to see the work that the Turtle Group is doing. It's really exciting approach, a real whole of community. I love the arts work that you do and I'm really looking looking forward to uh, working with your group and making sure that um, your initiatives are built into that catchment plan um, and that you know we can support your activities. Thanks Louise, uh, that, that was a really interesting information. The catchment management plan is such an important project and we're really happy to hear about it. Um, if anybody is interested and would like to get involved, please don't hesitate to contact council. Another great project that we work on uh, when it comes to our water quality in, in the area is our annual catchment and waterways report card. So you may have seen it around before, we've been doing it for about 10 years, it's a great project. Uh, so the, the report card is an annual project that we undertake with the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. And the scientists from DPIE come for about six months every year and they do testing extensively throughout our waterways. And at the end of that, they assign each of the waterways a score based on their water quality at the time of testing. And we use that to produce a report card. So you can have a look at our website. Uh, you can have a look by catchment if you're on our website. But if you want to have a look at everything, um, this is our report card down here. And you can see um, that we assign that, that score. It's between A and F, so much like a school report card, A means good, F means not so good. Um, these are our scores from last year, from 2019, and you can see that it's throughout our catchments and it's actually the material that we get from this, the, the results that we get from this project are what we then use to help plan our, our management actions throughout the year to try and improve the water quality or keep it um, going where we get good scores. So the 2020 results will be out in about October or November. Keep an eye out. Um, I think they're going to be very interesting scores this year considering that we've had extensive drought, um, bushfire events and flooding during that period as well. Um, so there'll be some more information coming out about that 
uh, closer to the release date in October. I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much to Andrew, Claire, Bronwyn, Kerry and Louise for presenting this evening. It was so great to have you all along um, to talk about all this amazing work that is happening throughout our catchments, uh, particularly here in the Manning and what is being done to protect this amazing species. It uh, doesn't exist anywhere else, so we, we really need to do our best to preserve it. And thank you so much for all of your hard work and for presenting this evening. I also want to just take this opportunity to say thank you to all of you who attended. Uh, we've run this series over the last six weeks with several different presentations and we've had a great turnout for all of them and honestly we couldn't do this without you giving up your evening and coming along and joining us so thank you so much for, for coming along and I'd also like to thank Hunter Local Land Services. Without them we couldn't put on this series. Uh, this really is a partnership project and we really appreciate all of their help. We will be doing a few more of these starting in August, September. So keep an eye out on your email and there'll be another series of catchment and marine discovery events coming soon. Thank you all again for attending and we hope to see you in the future.